This video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Now, when it comes to human history and horrible events, we can say that we are definitely spoiled for choice. So for this video, I decided to select some things that might not be the most horrible things ever happened, but these are things that you might have not heard of before. Let's go. Hello, number ones. Welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Let's talk about biological warfare. I think most of us have the tendency of associating biological warfare with modern warfare. But surely enough, as we read the definition of it, you'll immediately realize that this could have definitely been done in the past. Biological warfare definition, the use of toxins of biological origin or microorganism as weapons of war. There is a certain level of evidence which points to the possibility of medieval forces from several kingdoms and different geographical areas catapulting corpses, both human and animal, with the military objective of causing the spread of infectious diseases, hence causing outbreaks, within enemy fortifications, towns and castles. The intent would not only be to cause physical harm, well, that of course, but it would also be tactical because of the great psychological distress of such a manoeuvre. Considering the miasmatic understanding of disease people had at the time, they would be frightened. This, of course, is an aggravating factor on top of seeking shelter from constant night and day bombardment, increasing, therefore, the likelihood of surrender. The most famous claim is from the Genoese notary Gabriele de Mussi, which was discovered in 1842. He claimed that the Mongols hurdled plague-infested bodies into Kaffa in 1346, and has allegedly connected this act of warfare to the spread of the Black Death. A deadly epidemic connected to the Yersinia pestis bacterium, a series of complex bacterial strains that spread all over Europe between 1346 and 1353. The plague killed over a third of the entire population, bringing an ecologic reign of terror. Now, this of course is a very strong claim and there are a lot of different factors that have to do with the Black Plague and if you're interested I made a video like 30 years ago. But it is important to underline that even though this is a powerful piece of information, he most likely wasn't an eyewitness, in fact he was believed to be in Piacenza, near Genoa, at the time. So he definitely witnessed the arrival of the plague in Italy, but when it comes to the alleged sieging operation, that's second-hand information. So it's contemporary, but not eyewitness, still intriguing. And this brings us to two questions. Question number one, could medieval people actually do it? Like, technically speaking, is it possible for the engineers of the time to use the sort of medieval artillery to catapult a full body? Because you see, whether it be the body of a horse or the body of a human, it's not exactly the most aerodynamic mass. Not to mention a lot of medieval cities had 10 meters tall walls. And if they were able to do it, which we still have to discuss, did they do it? All right, one thing at a time. Without going too deeply into the concept of medieval artillery, although if you're interested, I could totally make a dedicated video, let me know in the comments. Two specific types of war machines come to mind, the mangonel and the trebuchet. The former used traction through rope pullers and the latter used a counterweight mechanism relying on gravity for dropping the counterpoise. Now, this is gonna get a little dark here, but I mean, you did click the thumbnail. But manganels had a limited throw weight, so if we are talking about throwing something, it would have been heads. Now, this mechanical limitation seems to be consistent with the reported cases, because anything before the 14th century, there are a few exceptions, but the majority of reports from before the 14th century are all about heads, so you can only throw heads at a time. <laughs> only throw heads. And when it comes to this specific period, there is an interesting mention from 1099, so we are specifically during the Crusades, whereby you have a crusading army and they are sieging an enemy town, but then they identify a Muslim spy among them. So what they decide to do is, hey, how about we put the spy on top of one of our mangonels and we catapult it onto the enemy town, so, you know, we can scare them. Basically, they couldn't reach because, of course, you can't put your war machines too close to the enemy defensive system because then they can destroy your machines and they were very expensive, complicated to build. So they try that, but it just doesn't work very well and the spy falls on the ground, probably breaks a few bones. Heads, however, assuming a trajectory of 40 meters and a 45 degree angle to overcome 10 meters high walls at a maximum distance of 20 meters from the wall, yeah, you could pull that one off. Not sure if you want to, but I mean, it is the medieval period, isn't it? 
but what about the mid to late 14th century, 15th century, the period in which the a counterweight trebuchet reaches its maximum anti-wall destructive power. Well, by then we could say that the presence of minimal technological prerequisites for tossing a full animal or human body would be definitely met. So, if you have access to a full-on trebuchet, yeah, you could do it. All right, so technically they could do it, but did they do it? Uh, just because they could, it doesn't mean they did. Well, let's have a look. Medieval chronicles do mention this occurrence several times and there are these three specific sieges where we have specific mentions of bodies, infected bodies, being thrown inside enemy fortifications. Now of course not all sources are credible, we can't always believe, there's always a little bit of propaganda, particularly as we go to the Roman period, because we will on this video, so it's not like we can believe everything we are told, but since we have consistent mentions of this sort of tactic from different geographical areas, from different armies at different locations and time, I feel confident enough to say that the available empirical evidence does seem to suggest that yes, biological warfare was a thing in the medieval period. Think about that. So, moral of the story is, next time you find a spy in your midst and you decide to throw into the enemy fortification, make sure to use a trebuchet, or perhaps avoid the spying altogether and use today's wonderful sponsor, Atlas VPN. Now, if you're like me and you like to surf the internet looking for interesting historical information, it's a great idea to do it in safety, which is why you should totally use today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. A VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel, and this way it protects you from spying, public Wi-Fi dangers, it hides your IP address and online activities. Atlas VPN is a great choice because it was developed by cyber security specialists, and among other things, it gives you access to the data Breach Monitor, which is a security feature designed to track any data breaches related to your online account, automatically scanning any leaked information. But another add-on through Atlas VPN is the fact that you can use Netflix from any countries, regardless of where you are. So let's say that you wanted to watch a show that is only available in the UK, but you live in America. No problem, just change your country through the VPN and boom, access granted. I always have Atlas VPN active on my machine, so that is because one account lets you use multiple devices. I personally really like Atlas VPN not only because it's a great choice, but also because it's really affordable, and that links to today's special offer. So, grab the summer deal. $1.83 a month for 3 years plus 3 months for free and 30 days money back guarantee. So, if you've been considering getting a VPN but you weren't sure about the prices, then now is the time. And don't forget to click the link in the description. That's $1.83 a month for 3 years plus 3 months for free. Keep in mind that this is a time limited offer so be quick and click the link in the description. And big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring my video. So whenever we think about the Vikings or the Norse, we think of their weapons, we think of their shields. Look at this one, goodness gracious, can't even see me anymore. We of course imagine their so-called drakkar, although the correct term is probably drekar. You know, the ships with all of these on the sides, really cool looking. And then you imagine their houses, specifically the longhouses. Why you say? Well, because longhouses are very striking. They stick to your memory because they look awesome, which is one of the reasons why we find them in all sorts of fantasy media. Look at Skyrim, for example, with the fires in the middle. They just look like Viking houses most of the times. And that's also one of the reasons why when I play the likes of Valheim, the first thing I do every game is build a longhouse. Okay, so uh, Norse longhouses are awesome. So why did they make this list? Well, it has been suggested that several houses within the Scandinavian and greater Germanic world during the Viking Age might have caused dangerous health problems to their inhabitants due to exposure to high level of carbon monoxide, among other things. Now, of course, I'm generalizing a little bit. We are not talking about every single possible type of structure that was inhabited during this period. We are, in fact, talking about a specific specimen, namely a house made of wattle and daub with thatched roofs and a fire in the center of the house. But it is, however, possible to apply the sort of information I'm about to share with you with a lot of other different types of similarly constructed domestic dwelling typologies. The main problem has to do with the air quality of such living quarters, specifically during winter, as during summer, 
less time will be spent inside these homes, for obvious reasons. The main problem seems to be the usage of a fire made from solid fuels, for cooking and heating purposes. For such houses, typical custom will be to put the fire in the centre, well done Skyrim, generating radiating gradient heat. Now, here is the kicker. Regardless of several possible openings in the house, say a hole in the roof or several windows or perhaps just leave the door open. Or we'll scratch that one in Scandinavian winter, mate. Regardless of the sort of opening used in such houses for air exchange optimization, a certain rate of continuous exposure to the smokes generated by these fires could lead to lower respiratory infections and lung diseases. This will be the case because of several aggravating factors, say carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, and perhaps the most dangerous of all, a byproduct of the smoke, fine particles in the air. Even though the parameters would vary depending on the exact type of construction, location, humidity, temperature and weather conditions, the average concentration of such risky elements would have most likely been above the current recommended daily guidelines from the WHO. Not to mention that the simpler constructions when it comes to the roofs would have had even more problems in a situation of very strong winds which could have impeded completely the smoke from leaving the house. Yeah, you know what, I'll just stick to reenacting full-on battles and just leave the reenactment of everyday Norse living to the most audacious among you. Now, considering a full-on extended family with a couple of friends over, with an averaging fuel consumption on a daily basis of 50 kilograms of hardwood for heat generation and for cooking, estimating a possible inside temperature of between 17.5 to 15 degrees Celsius, which would be significantly warmer than the outside during a, an average day in winter in Scandinavia. I, I want to guess that a lot of the time people stayed inside. Given, some people would of course stay out, hunting, traveling, working the fields, draining, chopping wood, but still, even smaller concentration of long-time exposure, such as for cooking or heating as mentioned, of carbon monoxide on human beings will have quantifiable negative effects. I will be testing this in the game Valheim on my third channel, The Protectorate. I'm gonna boot up the game and since the game does have a little simulating system, very interesting for smoke management inside the houses you build with possible air intoxication. I want to see how realistic it is considering the available data that we've just discussed. I'm gonna do that, do not miss out, subscribe to my third channel, link in the description. Come on, we need to get to 5,000 subscribers today! Now who hasn't heard of Julius Caesar or how I'm gonna pronounce it from now on in Latin, Julius Caesar? Do you know who Julius Caesar is? No? You're fired. Whatever you think about him, his military achievements were incredible, but so were the atrocities that some of his legions and men and forces committed in enemy territory, for example, in Gaul. Now, I believe most of you will be familiar with the Commentari de Bello Gallico, where he talks about his campaign or military campaign in Gaul. But maybe you're not familiar with this one, the Siege of Uxelludunum. Now, get ready, because we're going to get really dark. A contextual analysis will be required to fully understand the complexity of these historical events that I'm about to talk about, but that would require a dedicated video if you're interested, as usual, you know the drill. Anyhow, to cut a long story short, but still give you a little bit of context, in 58 BC, Julius Caesar decides, you know what, I want Gaul, and he proceeds marching with a lot of legions into enemy territory. And by 52 BC, he has won one of the most critical battles, the Siege of Alesia. But even in the face of this and all the other Roman victories, the fact that the Romans managed to make sure that the Gallic tribes didn't unite against Rome, still rebellions were a problem. They happened all the time and Caesar not only wanted to quench them, but he also wanted to prevent them. Keep this one in mind. So, the Gauls did not stay put, particularly two specific tribes, the Cadurci and the Senones. Now, these were particularly problematic from the point of view of the Roman Republic because not only they rebelled against Rome, but they basically turtled inside a fort. And I'm talking about the hill fort of Uxellodunum. Not only this was an extremely fortified stronghold, but it was also surrounded by natural defenses such as steep hills and rivers all around. So four and a half Roman legions are dispatched in order to take care of the rebels. The thing is that the rebels have no intention to face the Romans. In fact, their plan all along was, we'll just wait in here, we 
do not surrender to the Romans, we do not want to be friendly to the Romans, we'll just wait for Julius Caesar to lose control, but he's never gonna have us. But of course the Romans couldn't have that, because if they can do it, and other Gauls will do it, and yeah, we can't have that. So, four and a half legions had a lot of men, but a frontal assault into such a well-defended fort was not an option. So the Romans start to apply their usual tactics, which was, well, we're just gonna starve them to death. So you surround with your troops, again, four and a half legions is just right, and they place their scouts in a very strategic way, making sure that they can always see, oh look, they're trying to forage, let's go kill them. And this actually did happen, in the sense that they tried to forage, but the Romans just butchered them, and so they retreated back. Now, by this time, Julius Caesar himself decides, you know what, I'm going to join the siege myself. So, he takes a cavalry detachment and joins the legions. This is when Julius Caesar decides that just waiting for them to starve was not gonna cut it. Mostly because that would have taken too long. So he decides instead, how about we cut their water supply? I'm going to read in Caesar's actual words how he describes the situation as he arrives. I'll read it in English translation here, but I will also have a full-on reading of the Latin with all of the phonemic vowel length expressed in the members section as an extra, for those who are interested in the Latin with the phonemic vowel length. Of course, classical Latin pronunciation, so I don't have to force it on people who are not interested, but if you are interested, please join the channel. And thank you for your support. Having arrived at Uxello Dunum, contrary to the general expectation, and perceiving that the town was surrounded by the works, and that the enemy had no possible means of retiring from the assault, and being likewise informed by the deserters that the townsmen had abundance of corn, he endeavoured to prevent their getting water. A river divided the valley below, which almost surrounded the steep craggy mountain on which Uxellodunum was built. The nature of the ground prevented his turning the current, for it ran so low down at the foot of the mountain that no drains could be sunk deep enough to draw it off in any direction. But the descent to it was so difficult that if we made opposition, the besieged could neither come to the river nor retire up the precipice without hazard of their lives. Kaiser, perceiving the difficulty, disposed archers and slingers, and in some places, opposite to the easiest descents, placed engines, and attempted to hinder the townsmen from getting water at the river, which obliged them afterward to go all to one place to procure water. Okay, so there were two different sources that they could get water from. They were both inside the walled fortifications. One went down into this valley and he placed archers and ballistas to bombard anyone who would try to get the water. But the other one is, it's insane. In order to prevent the town folk to go and get water from the other spring, which was coming from the top of the mountain, he sent engineers to build a tunnel underneath the mountain to reach the spring and then divert the stream and block the water from reaching the town. Anyhow, that works, they surrender. And here is where shit hits the fan, excusing my Latin. In order to send a message to all other Gallic and Germanic tribes in general, Caesar proceeds to have the hands of all the male of fighting age from this town cut off. Then he sends all of these mutilated people in the thousands all across Gallia. Mass mutilation to exemplify the consequences of rebelling against the Roman Republic. Anyways, I think this is enough uh, dark history for me for one day, but if you are interested, I'm going to make this into a series, of course. Everything depends on you. What you like, I make. As usual, Noble Ones, if you liked this video, please remember to subscribe, become a Noble One, subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron, and also don't forget to click the link in the description to take advantage of the amazing offer Atlas VPN has for you. As always, thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.